one to three years means three years. You go to state prison, you're gonna do three years inside or you're gonna do them outside on parole, one way or the other. After I got sentenced, I was in Queens House detention, which I think is closed now. It's on Queens Boulevard, above, next to the courthouse. Then I went to Rikers Island to C-74, because that's where you go when sentence inmates go. That's where the bus picks you up, where the State Department of Corrections comes and you officially be transferred into their custody. And they shackle you up with the chains. Like, it's not like you're just cuffed to the person next to you going to court every month at Rikers Island. Like, but with State, they put the chain around you, and then they have the cuffs connected to the chain with a clamp with a little lock on it so you can't lift your arms up and then they shackle your, your ankle, one ankle to the other inmate that you're gonna be on the bus with. So you realize oh, you know, all of a sudden that's a big difference, you know what I'm saying? Now you really know that it's, it's serious. It was a maximum security prison and because of downstate was a maximum security prison, the problem with that was you were only supposed to be there for like a week, maybe two weeks. I was taking medication at the time, so for whatever reason, his doctor had a hold on me, and I was there for three months. You locked in the you locked in the cell most of the day. You go to like for me, we went to the mess hall three times a day, which is mandatory. And we got TV time more because we were in an extended classification. There's like four complexes they're called. And I was on like complex four, which for extended classification. So three months go by, and I'm fucking still there. And it's like all right, whatever. Every day counts. So from downstate prison in Fishkill, I was what they call when they tell you you're being transferred, which is they call drafted. I was transferred, drafted, sent to Green County Prison. It's in Catasauqua, New York. I think it's like maybe three hours or so more upstate. Anyway, it's a medium purity facility. Still a prison, and fences with razor wire and all that shit. It's for younger inmates, like teenagers and early 20s, people that don't know how to act. So that place was not a good place. It was just not good. It's just a fucked up crazy place because the young kids are in prison already for you know they Rikers Island for a few years and now they're upstate so they obviously don't they haven't learned how to deal with issues so they just react so you know you get into a fight or you get into an argument and someone could just get slashed or stabbed or whatever the fucking happened so a lot of that craziness and a lot of that young rowdy bullshit you don't want to even go to the yard at night or the day because the yard has armored correctional vehicles surrounding it because they know something's probably gonna happen or things been going on. They're getting ready to tear gas the yard. So I would just be like, nah, I don't think I'm going. And they wanna see when you go to the yard, they use the wand, like the metal detector wand, to you know, wand you down before you go in. And they're looking to see how many layers you got on. You got like two jackets on, cause it's cold. They figure, okay, he's layered up too much. He's probably maybe gonna get into something. You might got problems with him, might someone try to stab him. Cause it's like more body armor, you know what I'm saying? More protection. So they look for things like that. You just like know sometimes like, yeah, I think I'll just stay in the dorm and just go, you know, read a book or watch TV and do something. So what happened at your one year prison review? Was your counselor confused why you were there? Well, my counselor actually, when I got to Green, within a week or so, she came in, she called out three names, me and these two other kids. And then we all came out, out of the dorm area. So she called our names and just goes, oh, but you, I want to talk to you first. I was like, all right. So I get in the room, sit down, and she's like, okay, now tell me, what, now what did you really do? And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. She goes, this whole thing, like, all right, did you break car windows and slash tires and use car parking lot or a car parking lot? You know, something like that or something like crazy like that. I was like, nah, it's whatever is there is what I did. She goes, so you're saying you did graffiti with spray paint or whatever. You're tagging your name. I was like, yeah, that's basically, yeah, basically. She goes, just, and she got really angry and really upset because, and then she broke everything down why she's like that. And it's like every, you know, day, every week, I see kids being sent here when they could have been dealt with differently. So you could have been handled differently, but you weren't. So now what's going to happen is now you lost fear of being incarcerated, just like everyone else does. So the chances of you, when you leave, you're just not scared and it does something and you can go one way or another. It can, it can do things to you, it can break you. When you see this all the time for such stupidity, it's kind of like it gets you very upset because then they have us here wanting to, well, we're supposed to do something to rehabil rehabilitate you. And it doesn't, that's not the case. She eventually got me transferred to a work relief facility, but I ended up getting the parole eventually at that point anyways. It was in Washington Heights, the facility. So instead of getting parole from upstate, I got released from that facility instead of being released from upstate. So it was a little easier. You don't have to take a fucking bus three, four hours, you know. 
And also, she was trying, she just said like, these are all young kids here, a lot of drama. So she goes, and you, you seem like a good kid. And she goes, if there's any problems, you just talk to me and try and share me while I'm there so I don't fall into the bullshit to make things worse for me. Did your overly prosecuted punishment make you want to write even more? I was, um, you could say bitter. I was uh, bitter, you know, but like now I say like, yeah, certain things I admit that, yeah, I was a pain in the fucking ass. Can you tell me the story of the night you tagged the fire station, the 107th Firehouse? Oh, in East New York? Yeah. yeah that was like, oh yeah, that, the firehouse around the block from where I, where, where I used to live, on Linden Boulevard. Um, yeah, that was, oh God, it was, uh, I was on, I got released from that facility, barely, barely, a month maybe, I was on parole, one month, barely, not even. Parole means you're still an inmate, you're not free, that's what that means. You're just doing your prison time on parole in the street, as long as you follow the rules. I'm thinking parole and probation, yeah, same thing, yeah, I was wrong. So I basically just hit the ground running and just, I was still gonna write. So there was a really bad blizzard that week. New York City is buried under tons of snow and we are going to feel the impact for days to come. Snow covered tracks caused the last three cars of an equipment train to slip off the rails. And first of all, I didn't like, okay, I'm not gonna say I didn't know it was a firehouse, but it was, to explain it, it used to be an entrance. There's the firehouse and then there's the train yard underneath the building, the A train and C train. There used to be an entrance there. You go in, you got to like, like, and shimmy down like a poles. These poles could just like a, like a story down, like, you know, it's on the ground. So there was some old graffiti on there from the 80s still. And I always wanted that spot. So basically that's why I did. It wasn't because it was a firehouse. But you know, it's funny. I did that shit. They ain't never cleaned it. I mean, it's not there because someone went over it. You could see like part of my, my shit sticking out, the, the D. But it's like, but they never fucking cleaned it to this day. It's like, come on. Did the court watchers go to the courthouse for this case too? Yeah, but not like they did before. It was only like, like so many, like a handful. When you're on parole and you get arrested for a misdemeanor, they have to run it concurrent with whatever your parole violation gives you. They have to run it together. So you're really not getting any time for the crime, you're getting time for a violation. The felony supersedes the misdemeanor because it's a more serious crime, because, you know, and that's basically how it works. So they gave me a year, Rikers Island for like a year, it's like, you know, you come out like a fucking crazy person. By the time I got there, three days from the precinct and central booking, it was like back then, it was three day fucking affair. It wasn't like 12 hours, 20 hours, like nowadays. Central Booking is like a ghost town nowadays over the past few, so many years that I've experienced. But back then, nah, it was a three day thing. It was like overpacked, it was inhumane. It was, Brooklyn especially was the worst. So it took me three days to see a judge, high bail and all this bullshit because I'm on parole. Then it's all up to four days by the time you get to Rikers Island. And then you go, you, well, you're processed, you go to the intake, you get put in the system, and then you go to the clinic to get your medical, your blood work and all that. Then they take you to the dorm. So it was already midnight or one o'clock in the morning. Lights are out. So I go in and, you know, they watch you when you come in. And the one thing, when you come in and if you don't know how to make your bed, because the bed, the mattresses are thin. So when you put the sheet on, it's not fitted. You have to basically fold the bed up to one side and put it over and tie it off in a knot, right? Put it down and then the other side like that and tie it and like that. So I came in and I tied my shit up real quick like that. So they see this, they know you're not, you know, you, they, you, you've been in jail, you, you, you know how to jail. It's a sign, they, they watch people, because there's people come in, they don't know what the fuck they're doing, they're like, they don't know what they're doing. So then, but then I'm, I know I'm watching, I notice they're looking and, and then one guy comes over Spanish guy, Puerto Rican, I don't know who it was, Dominican. And he's like, he's like, hey, are you, you, you in the paper, the kids, the, the graffiti in the paper? I was like, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's me. He's like, oh man, I told you, that's the Blanquito, they're the, they're the Blanquito in the paper, the Blanquito in the paper. And everyone's like, ah, no way, and they're all talking to me. I'm like, oh boy, that's all I fucking need. And how old were you at this time? Then I was, um, I was 20, because I turned 20 and 21 locked up. So I spent those birthdays locked up. When in 19, I turned 21 in Rikers Island in 1996, May 1996, yeah. Did you run into anyone on Rikers while you were there? 
Um, that I knew? Yeah. Oh, did I run into any one of the records on that I knew when I was there? Um, yeah, I, a few people. Mainly, um, Scuff. I ran into a bunch of times. First time I seen him, I was work. I worked in the mess hall for in this one building for a long time, in C ninety five. Um, so I was leaving the mess hall with a, a female correctional woman to go to. They have the cells areas on one side of the jail, and then the dormitories on the other side. So we had to go to the dormitory area. So she had to go with me. There'd be leftover trays in the houses because. In that jail, at the time, for a long time, the mess hall was closed for inmates to eat in because of the violence over the years, they shut it down. So every, you had to bring the food to the houses. Everyone ate in the houses. So that was like a big thing, three meals a day. So I worked overnight, so we basically had to deliver breakfast on the carts. So sometimes the trays weren't all sent back and it was like two here, five here, you know. So there's a, there's a lack, you know, shortage. So you gotta go around collecting them. So I had to go to the dorm with her. So we're going to pick up the, the leftover trays that weren't returned. So I'm coming out of the mess hall, I'm walking, and I see the, the new inmates coming in from the intake room, you know, going to the clinic, with the clinic is across from the mess hall. So I see in the crowd, I see Scuff, and I seen PG. I didn't really know him like that. You know, I didn't met him before, but I didn't really know him like that, but I seen Scuff. So I threw my hands up, like, what happened? And then he just motioned, like, you know, spray can, you know, painting. And um, so I was like, all right, I'm, I'm gonna come find you because I wanted to try to get him a job working the mess hall with me so he'd get moved, you know, so we could be together. But the guy that worked in the intake, he also worked in the mess hall certain nights, two, three nights a week, you know, as he, but the main thing, he did the intake. I had to wait for him to come in. By the time he got in, a few days later, Scuff already got bailed out, so. So by then, he was already gone. So I basically, that's the first time I ran into him. And then I was in another building, I don't know, down the line, and I'm in the, the, the bullpens, and I hear someone calling my name, saying Rob. I'm like, I just answered them, and then I was like, oh wait, yo, who, who the fuck is that? And then he said, you know, his name, and I was like, oh. And I was like, yo, let me ask you a question. He's like, what? I was like, are you fucking bored or something? He's like, what the fuck you mean? I was like, why the fuck you keep coming back here, dude? What's wrong with you? He's like, nah, you don't even know. And he got into a whole story about why he's back this time. And that time he was, he had, he got to do, he had to do, I don't know how many months, whatever. But then we've seen it then, you know, eventually again, and I'm in another building and then run into him again. He's like, everywhere I go, you just, you just don't, they don't let you out. You're just, you, you, what are you, it's like you're content. You're just here, you like it here. It's like you're just there everywhere I go. So basically by then, that, now when he was in, in the next building, we got to see each other more often because he was like two, two floors down. He was like on the bottom and I was like on the third floor, like right below me. So we were able to actually go to the yard. We got to, you know, go to the mess hall together. And he was like, yo, what is that thing you're writing with in the, in the hallways and the staircase? It's like a black mean streak. I was like, oh, I pulled it out. It was a big black industrial crayon. I was like, yeah, I broke it in half and I gave him half. So now, we we bombing all the, all the hallways and the staircases together and separately. And so basically, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun. It was like we weren't in jail. We didn't, it, nothing changed, you know what I'm saying? It was, it, we were just kids. It was, it was a good time. Then December 1997, I got hit by a car. It was on Avenue A by Thompson Square Park. It's in some rat hole little bar. We were in there and people I was with were smoking a blunt. And they complained because, and then I had like a 22 of Beck, so Heineken, that's all I used to drink. So obviously you don't sell 22s in the bar. So they were like smoking the weed and this and that. They basically want us to, to leave because, you know, which, okay, fine. We were leaving and they wanted to come out. So now like when you get outside, yo, we're leaving and now they want to escalate a problem. And it's like we're outnumbered four to one. It's just four of us all together. And, you know, I just ended up losing my fucking patience and... I tried to do things. I tried to cut a bunch of people. I got hit by this car. This guy was drunk and coked up, and he almost killed me. But then again, I was trying to kill these other motherfuckers because I just got tired of all the tough talk and all the bullshit. From the car hitting me, I, injured my, I broke both legs, my hip in so many places. I had to have pins and rods put in, and I broke in my face. My jaw, I had, I had plates, like four plates I had to put. It wasn't just fractured, it was broken. They had to put it back together, like the plates, like connected together. So it was bad. It was really bad damage to my jaw. I broke all like in here. I have all screws and plates in here. 
And then I got this very serious infection in my face. They couldn't even do surgery for like a few weeks on my face because the infection was that bad. They had to wait, they did my legs first. So the infection went away, but then it came back and it, it came back so many times that I had more surgeries on my, on my face and jaw. And it was so bad that it, was, it doesn't take long for it to spread from here to your eyes, to your brain, you know what I mean? You know, it, it's quick. So it just kept coming back and coming back and coming back and it's, it was a real problem. So it was just like really stressful. I was not even conscious. I was like in a coma somewhat, you know, different stages of comas. So I was in like whatever stage coma I was in, let's say. Then when I came conscious, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. So I'm pulling out the IVs. And at the time I still had a breathing tube in my mouth, my throat. They had to put a trach in because they were going to do the surgery on my face. But at the time I still had the breathing tube, so they had to restrain me and tie me up. And I was thrashing around and they basically, I could kill myself because your body can shut down and go into shock and you could die. Even though you, you, you're getting better, you just make yourself die because your blood pressure shoots up. So basically I kept doing all that. So now they put me in a medicated coma. So now like, so the whole fucking time I was in the hospital, I don't even know what the fuck I was or what was going on except for like the last week and a half. So the whole time I was just like, what the fuck am I? The whole crying to the nurse, that's like the last week and a half. And then finally the last five days I was in a regular room because I was in ICU the whole entire time except for the five days they put me in a regular room. Because they put me in and they, they, they put a different trach in and they, where you could plug the hole so now I can speak. And, and they took the feeding tube out my nose. They wanted to see if I could breathe on my own so they, you know, for a day and I was good. So then they took the trach out and they just put a bandage over it because that seals, heals up on its own. How long was it before you could walk? Oh, it's like between the time in the hospital and then at home, like probably six, seven months or some shit. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't walk for a while. Like I was fucked up. I couldn't even eat for, for forever because my jaw was wide shut for nine months. My jaw is a little shifted now because of the accident. So it was wired. And then when they cut the wires, my jaw was locked shut. I had um, problems. So that's why I had to have more surgeries. That's when I got the other infections that were so bad that it was, it was really a problem. So the, they had to take out the, I don't know what the fuck it's called, the mandible. The, you know, you got the two things that like hinges. Like, so I don't have one here because I had to take it out because it was, it was locked. So the only way to get rid of it is to pull it out and to take it out to unlock my jaw. And then I had to manually fucking get my jaw cranked open with fucking tongue depressors, with the fucking ice cream stick things. You have to put them in and slide one in, two in, three, and it crank your jaw open because it just won't open, you know what I'm saying? It's the only way to get it. And to this day, my mouth will never open like a normal person, like it never, like it used to. So it just opens like so much, it, it's, it's fucking annoying. And the fact that I couldn't eat for so long, nutrients and insures, like, and then because my jaw is like a little shifted and twisted, like crooked, so when I was able to get it open somewhat, so then I was able to like eat like potatoes and like, like chopped meat and things like that, like chicken, mushy, like cut up, soft food finally. But for such a long time, I couldn't eat. So I was just skinny already. So I was just, I just did not get better. I looked like I was dying. I like, had like rings under my eyes. I just looked like I was gonna die. You know, I wasn't good. It's was horrible. I started to collect books. Everyone thinks because I was locked up. I, yeah, I read in there, prison, but in jail, but it was more later on. I started getting into reading because after I got better, I still continued to do what I would do and I would get arrested and then they're trying to lock me up again. And they're trying to lock me up again. It's just like it doesn't end. And so I got probation again. And then I was the second time. And then like recently I completed some other fucking probation I was on for the third time. But that was the second time. So. I basically had to make a decision. I had to stop hanging out. I just, I just stopped hanging out altogether for a long time. So basically when I went out in the day or whatever, I'd do my own thing and it's like, I couldn't hang out at night because I just not was gonna let myself end up in the hospital or in a jail cell because I'm hanging out with other people and because of the choices they made. I'm, I have my own fucking problems with making my own decisions and making bad ones. So I end up getting myself locked up or hurt or whatever. So it's kind of like, I'd rather wake up in my own bed instead of jail or hospital. I totally just stopped hanging out. So that's when I started getting into books and all that shit. What subjects do you enjoy reading? It was like Vietnam War, like that whole Southeast Asia, like Pol Pot, like in Cambodia, World War II. 
there's so much there. When you read about it, you kind of like see like the ignorance about it. It was just stuff that you didn't learn in school. And true crime also, I read, you know, everything from mafia, true crime. All of that shit I know, whatever's to know, I know. And I still even go online and research. I go to municipal archives in Manhattan and I print out all this shit on whatever they got and all the fucking court papers. I really get into it. And then to this day, I go online, I, I look up old newspaper articles and I read them and I, I save them on my phone because you get more accurate information from back then than the 20s and 30s. I have so many books in storage. I mean, forget it. That all started after my accident and after I started staying in because I could not continue getting arrested. The idea of my million dollar vandal book came about from my friend Alan that does 12 ounce profit. He, he did another, he did a book before that that was called, also known as, in that book, photos of me doing tags, mop tags and trains or something. In that book, out of all the things, out of what everyone said, my photos were one of the two or three things out of the book that anybody had mentioned that were the best. So he felt that to do something specifically on me would be good. And at first I wanted it to be a more most talked about where it would be a group of us. So it would be like not just one story, it would be many stories, you know. But he said, I don't know. And I was like, all right, well, I mean, he wants to do it. He's putting all the money into it. He's doing, he did a lot of work for the book. He put a lot of money into it. And the book to this day, I mean, everyone says, I say it's such good quality, you know, the way he did it. It's really a good book because he did it on his own. He, you know, did a really good job on the book. And I always apologize because I was very not enthusiastic about it. Cause I don't, I'm a, not a big believer in myself. I'm just like, you know, who am I? Nobody. So, and then the f other person involved taking photos, Alan took photos and there was another person named Prescott. He actually passed away like years ago and he had really good camera equipment. That's why some of the photos came out so good because of the, the, the camera that was being used. Do you still have your photo collection? I still have my photo collection. I have a lot, a lot of photos, so many. Would you ever want to make a book of your photographs? I mean, over the years, I never really had interest in doing it. I just ain't gonna let my pictures, I just ain't gonna let people have them. And, you know, basically they have control of them because they're not fucking copyrighted. So my big thing was like, you know, I never wanted to just, just jump into something like that. You know what I'm saying? You gotta do it with somebody or it's where it's like, you know, it's legit. You're not gonna get fucked over. And if I'm not gonna make money, oh, no, I think I'm good. You know what I mean? I don't care if Supreme wanted me to do a t-shirt with them. If I'm not getting some money and some shirts, like half and half, I don't fucking care. I don't, I don't give a shit. It doesn't mean nothing to me. But other people would do it for free. But I mean, I'm not doing that shit. Yeah, I would do something because I feel there's so much shit that I have that I would never post online on Instagram or anything like, you know, train photos, oh, lots of shit. I post little things here and there, but I have so much shit that I won't ever post because then it's out there. Everyone's got it. I'm not doing that. I'd rather have it be put in a book and online on Instagram. There are a lot of photos that are my photos and I could go to certain people's pages and go through them and be like, no, that's mine. They're all just all my fucking photos person wasn't even around probably at that time. Is there anything you want to say to the members or former members of the Ridgewood and Glendale community groups? Yeah and no. I don't want to ruffle any feathers, but I don't give a fuck what they think about me or what they thought about me or what they will think about me. It really wasn't that fucking serious, but I don't know. I mean, what did you do? You sent the kid to jail. So um, if they don't like me, they can go fuck themselves. That's all basically I got to say about them. Is they don't, I don't think about them at all because they don't exist to me. I have only one last question for you. Do you think you'll ever quit graffiti? <laughs> uh, what do you think? I don't know. Do you think I'll quit graffiti? Let's see. I, I just could say I just... I wouldn't hold your fucking breath with that one. I don't know, man. <laughs> like I said, when my heart stops, then that's when I'll stop being me, so. And at this point, they made me into the million dollar vandal, right? This is who I am, right? They made me this. They wanted this to be me. That's what I am, right? So what can I do? I don't know anything else. I don't know how to be nothing but myself. So like I said, don't hold your breath.
I do it for myself. Just for myself, not even to look at, just to do, but does something to me. 